Romans 11. 11 to 1 I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israelite, of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. Once again we have to ask the question, who are his people? Is it a people who rejected the Messiah, crucified him, and killed and persecuted the church? No God forbid. People misunderstand verses like these and think that God is going to save all of Israel, regardless if they accept the Messiah or not. That is heresy. So how is he going to save Israel? Read the parable of the wheat and the tares. God is going to separate them, Matt 25, when he returns at the final judgment. Those who are Israelites who believe on Jesus Christ and keep his commandments will be saved. Those of Israel in the flesh who reject him will be destroyed. Paul is also giving his identification as an Israelite from the tribe of Benjamin. As explained before, he is of the seed of Abraham. But he is a fulfillment of the seed of Abraham because he believed on Christ. 11-2 God hath not cast away his people which he foreknew. What ye not what the scripture saith of Elias? How he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying. The key word is foreknew. As explained in chapter 8, those he foreknows he will predestine to be conformed to the image of his Son. Not by force against our will. But according to us believing on him by him granting us faith and thus making the choice. 11-3 Lord, they have killed thy prophets, and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone and they seek my life. Elijah spoke against Israel testifying that they have killed the prophets and destroyed altars. And he thought he was the only one left. So how could God who is just and righteous save a people whom Elijah spoke against? 11-4 But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself seven thousand men, who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. He reveals to Elijah that there are already people who will be saved who have not become corrupted to sin. 11-5 Even so then at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. People get mixed up about the words election and grace. Election is not going against our will, but it is according to foreknowledge of us choosing to believe on him. Grace is not given blindly and loosely as though God doesn't care. Grace is also not giving us the liberty to violate the moral law, Ten Commandments and Dietary Laws, which still apply. But grace is given when we fall short of keeping those commandments and repent. God's grace is sufficient to fill the gap because His grace sustains us and is sufficient for us. 11-6 And if by grace, then is it no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace, otherwise work is no more work. What does Paul mean by does this verse? You can't conclude that Paul is teaching salvation without works. Also you cannot say that grace is not earned according to this verse. We know that nobody can't atone for their past by works. It is by faith in Christ only by grace. Also grace has always been the saving factor that saved man. Works have nothing to do with the end result of saving us. It is grace and faith in Christ only. Now to obtain that grace, we must believe on him and keep the commandments. That's the only way to biblically explain this verse. 11-7 What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. So Israel was blinded because they did not obtain it. For they were sinful. Who's the election that have obtained it? They are the church, the true Israel. 11 to 8, according as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear, unto this day. He's referencing Isaiah 32 3. 11 to 9 and David saith, Let their table be made a snare, and a trap, and a stumbling block, and a recompense unto them. 11 10 Let their eyes be darkened, that they may not see and bow down their back alway. In other words, let their trap spring upon them. It was God's will that they be blinded. 11-11 I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their full salvation is come unto the Gentiles, for to provoke them to jealousy. God did not make them stumble that they should fall. This means that God does not intend that any should perish, 
but that all should come to repentance. But they did fall for the purpose of bringing salvation to the Gentile world. The reason, to provoke them to jealousy, as is stated in the last part of the verse. If they need to be provoked to jealousy, then they have to move from where they're at spiritually to where the Gentiles are now. They who believe on Jesus Christ and keep his commandments. Whatever bad things happen in the world, it is to bring honor and glory to God. Also to accomplish his will. 11.12 Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? Another interesting question. The fall of the Jews is the riches of the world, bringing salvation through Jesus Christ. And the diminishing of the riches of the Gentiles, that being the riches in their sin. 11.13 For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. Paul was a chosen vessel to the Gentile world. And Peter was a chosen vessel to Israel. Notice when God called him and in Acts 9, he listed Israel as last for his mission. 11.14 If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh, and might save some of them. The word emulation basically means a desire to excel in things to a superior level. So Paul is saying he desires to provoke them to excel in a superior level to him. Which are my flesh? Meaning his blood brothers, Israelites. Might save some of them. Obviously meaning that he cannot say all of them. Only some of them. As Jesus said that many are called, but few are chosen. And few there be that find it. 11.15 For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be? but life from the dead? Again Paul is using terminology of their fall is a great benefit to the world. The receiving of them, Israel in the flesh, shall be life from the dead. But God cannot receive Israel, unless they come to him. The word receive means to be given. Not by force. So a sinner has to approach God in faith and belief before God can receive him. 11.16 For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy, and if the root be holy, so are the branches. Christ was the first fruits, see 1 Cor 15. The lump is the world. Christ is the root and we as believers are the branches. 11.17 And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou, being a wild olive tree, wert grift in among them, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree. Christ is the olive tree. Israel of the flesh are the branches broken off. We as the Gentile world were a wild olive tree. We were grafted in among Israel and with Israel we partook of the root, Christ, and the benefit of him as the olive tree. But Israel rejected and killed their Messiah. So how can we be grafted among them for the benefit of Christ? We were just as lost as Israel is. So were in the same basket of being heathens. However through Israel Christ came to his own, but his own received him not. So he turned to the Gentiles through their fall and rejecting him. 11.18 Boast not against the branches. But if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. What branches? The branches that were broken off. If we boast then we do not bear Christ. But Christ bears us. But keep in mind, Christ will not always bear with us there will come a time when he will have enough and his patience will run dry. The verse does not say that the root will always bear you. Every one of us falls victim to sin and at times. But his grace sustains us because he knows that we are human with a fallen nature. 11.19 Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be gruffed in. This is true, but sometimes some things do not need to be said because it is unnecessary. But if it is said, humility must be attached. Many times the truth of something is not what is at fault. But it is the person who said it who is at fault because of their intention by saying it. 11.20 Well, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. Paul gives a charge a reminder because he knew that many in his day were boasting because fallen people of Israel were broken off that Gentiles would be grafted into the church. They kept the works of the law of the ot, but thought it not by faith, which is why he mentions their unbelief, see sage 9. 
Therefore because we stand by faith through Christ, we should not be arrogant against the fallen ones. We should fear. 11.21 For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Why should we fear? Paul gives the answer. If he did not spare them through their disobedience, he will not spare us if we fall victim to disobedience. This verse is proving once again why the Oza's teaching is heresy and a lie. 1122 Behold therefore the goodness and severity of God, on them which fell, severity, but toward thee, goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. His wrath fell upon the Israelites because of their sin. But goodness was shown toward us because we believed on Christ as the foundation of our faith to build works upon. If thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shalt be cut off. Very clear that Ozas is wrong. As explained before, the word if is a condition word. The condition is on us to continue in his goodness. Or else we will be cut off and being cast into fire. Thus we have to earn his goodness and grace. 11.23 And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, shall be grift in, for God is able to graft them in again. Just to point this out right away. God does not ever grant somebody a second chance after they appear in hell from dying in their sins. But since God knows the beginning from the end, then he knows who will repent at the appropriate time. Remember the story of the prodigal son? He rebelled for a time, but came back. If the father was willing to receive him again into grace through his repentance and obedience, then he can do the same for the Israelites who repent and believe on Jesus Christ. Therefore they must be grafted into the church. But the choice is up to them. As I've stated before in previous posts, the blood of Jesus Christ does cleanse us from all sin. However, he will not force a cleansing of your whole future against your will. 11.24 For if thou wert cut out of the olive tree which is wild by nature, and wert grift contrary to nature into a good olive tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grift into their own olive tree? Again a long question, but clear one. Basically the question is rhetorical that does not require an answer. The phrase wild by nature is referring to the fallen nature obviously. And we were grafted into the church, which is contrary to our fallen nature. If God can do that, then obviously he can graft the natural branches, sinful Israel, into the tree again, if they repent and turn to Christ. 11.25 For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. This mystery we should not be ignorant of, which is the blindness of Israel. The point was to bring the Gentiles into the church as well under the new covenant. This is why in an earlier writing Paul declares there's neither Jew or Gentile because all are one in the body of Christ. 11.26 And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, There shall come out of Sion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. This is another verse that people misinterpret that God is going to save all of Israel, regardless if they believe on him or not. Basically forcing them to believe against their will. That is stupid and ridiculous because that would show God is guilty of favoritism, being the respecter of persons that he has warned against thus resulting in him contradicting his own commandment and nature in his word. It's obvious that he is referring to those that choose to believe through his gift of grace and faith. So all of Israel shall be saved who believe on Christ. To believe otherwise is to hold that God is a dictator to force people into salvation as mindless robots. Now to turn away the ungodliness from Jacob is to do two things. 1. First is to write his laws on their heart so they will continue to serve him. Many will take this as forcing it against their will so they cannot choose to rebel. 2. Second, it is actually a blessing because he will lift the sin curse from the world. This is to bring us back to the innocent state of Adam and Eve. Only it will be better, calling it a better covenant. 11.27 For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. Paul gives the answer here of how he will remove the ungodliness, as already explained above. 
their sins will be removed forever. 11.28 As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. This is interesting because they are our enemies because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But regarding election they are loved for the sake of the Father. This is because he knows who are his and who will be damned. So those who foreknows, will be saved in the end. They are our enemies because we don't know who will be saved in the end. But God knows and that's why those who will believe are loved. 11.29 For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. God does not go back on His Word. That is because His Word is still taking effect and converting sinners. 11.30 For as ye in times past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief. 11.31 Even so have these also now not believed, that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. We have obtained mercy through Christ because of their unbelief. He mentions that through our mercy they also may obtain mercy. This is because Jesus had to love your enemies. Since the Israelites of today, in this so-called nation of Israel, are not believers, they are our enemies. We are to love our enemies through action. This does not mean we stand by Israel to support their sin. But we also don't curse them by doing evil deeds and say evil words. An example of evil words to say is stating that God is done with Israel and they shall never be converted or believe on Christ. 11.32 For God hath concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. Notice he says he might have mercy. That's not a definitive conclusion that he will do so. That depends on them accepting the gospel truth of Christ. 11.33 Oh the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, and his ways past finding out. There are things about God that we will never understand until we die and obtain the fullness mind of Christ. We don't understand his ways to a point because we don't know all things. However this does not mean that God is a mystical being that we can never know or understand. If that were the case, then why do we have his word to explain what he wants from us? That's a contradictory belief system. 11.34 For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Or who hath been his counsellor? 11.35 Or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again. Does it say anywhere in this verse that we cannot know the mind of the Lord? No it does not. He's asking these questions not requiring an answer. Basically there are things in the mind of God that we cannot know in this life. Nobody has been his counsellor and no one first gave to him. He is in charge and he will choose what he does within reason according to his word. He doesn't have to defend himself or hold himself accountable because his word holds him accountable. 11.36 For of him, and through him, and to him, are all things, to whom be glory for ever. Amen. He is the beginning and the end. All glory and praise to him.